Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, this month's webinar, uh, specifically working on children and youth uh, challenges and, and some opportunities as well and best practices. So um, as folks roll in, we'll just start testing some of the, the tech, make sure it's, it's working. Uh, last time we had some issues with uh, people being able to chat in the text chat because we were just switching platforms. So. Uh, please say hello as you come in, uh, organization, uh, obviously your name, uh, organization, and um, traditional territory, Indigenous territory, if you know uh, off the top of your head. And if you don't, this is a great opportunity to look it up and, and let us know as well. And we're just going to give folks a couple minutes just to roll in before we, we kick off. Um, and if you're wondering if you're in the right place, this is the Health Seeker Technologies Empowering Children and Youth webinar, a data-driven approach uh, with some folks from amazing organizations that are going to be uh, doing their, uh, their parts shortly as well. So let's see, let's see if, um, if the text is working. Can you guys see the text um, if I say hello? See if it works for you. It works. Okay, I see thumbs ups. Excellent. Good. Good. Well, if so, let's try. Uh, let's try some. Um, some. Oh, there we go. Some intros, and I'll do shout outs uh, again. Well, well, folks, roll in. So, Flo from Peer Mediation and Skill Training. Tim. Hey, Tim. I just saw you yesterday. Uh, thank you. I'm okay. It's Treaty Seven. That's where we're at as well. Uh, MJ Curley. Oh my goodness, it's going so fast. Let's see. Um, okay. MJ Curley from Sudbury District Restorative Justice. Awesome. Thanks for joining. Uh, Nicole Wood from Rebound Child and Youth Services. Uh, Nicole, let us know where you're at too. Uh, what treaty uh, territory or, um, or city as well. Giselle from Code Youth Ottawa and Ashnabe Algonquin Territory. Amazing. Uh, Florence is from Treaty 7. We've got Halifax, Family SOS nonprofit, uh, Office of the Child and Youth Advocate, Treaty 6, Alberta, amazing, Kylie. And we've got Julia from Quint Development Corp and Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Program Manager for Transitional Housing and also Treaty 6. Uh, Tanya, Away Home Canada, our, our good, good friends and partners at Away Home Canada. Hello, Tanya, welcome. Um, obviously, Rob, Youth HQ Red Deer. Uh, we've got Christine from Encompass Support Services, Langley, BC. Oh, excellent. We're doing some fun work in B uh, in Langley, actually, on, on youth uh, well-being and on guns and gangs involvement there. Some really cool stuff. Hopefully, maybe you know about it. And uh, let's see. We've got Nina. And I'll, I'll do two more minutes of these, guys, just because folks are rolling in. Uh, from Barrie, Ontario, uh, with the Simcoe County, CAPC, and Barrie, Ontario, and Anishinaabe, uh, people um, including the Ottawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi nations. Excellent. I love that you guys know your territories. This is great. Stephanie Wright, Next Gen Men from Toronto, uh, Treaty 13. Josh and Sarah from the School of Music and Musqueam and Squamish Territories. Um, Mylene Garcia. Oh my gosh, I could just keep going. Uh, Camero, Toronto. Um, my goodness. Alliance for Children and Youth, Treaty 7. I don't even know all of these amazing organizations. Like we need to, we need to learn more about you guys. This is really cool. Um, take a hike, Youth Foundation, Blue Nose Marathon, Halifax. We were just chatting about Halifax uh, before you guys joined. CMHA Calgary and um, Blackfoot Confederacy. Very cool. Very, very, very cool. Um, making the shift. Again, partners of ours uh, making the shift around youth homelessness prevention. Uh, amazing. Keep them coming. Um, in the meantime, I will uh, get the party started because we've got lots of ground uh, to cover for, for everyone. And uh, this is going to be an interactive one for sure. So get your big questions ready to rock as well, because we, um, we've got some amazing experts here today. So I will get going and hopefully you all can see my screen. Give it a thumbs up if you can. And if not, uh, the technical team will, will deal with it. 
Uh, but in the meantime, I'll, I'll get started. Oh, good. I can see your thumbs up. Amazing. Amazing. So uh, we're going to get into this uh, with a short caveat about why HealthSeeker is a technology company is doing this type of work. And that's primarily because we work on complex social challenges. So um, all of our work as a social enterprise focuses on complex social issues, whether it's homelessness, uh, child uh, well-being, mental health, uh, addiction, uh, guns and gangs. We we had a webinar last year called From Guns and Gangs to Cats and Cults. You just these things are so interconnected and entwined and we build technology and data products to, to support folks. So some of you guys might know about us because of one of these products at the bottom there. So Cardo is an analytics platform that helps you generate insights out of diverse data sets. Could be your own data, could be public data. Navigi is a platform that helps you navigate a social system. Um, we have a sample of it actually up on our on our website if you want to kind of give a get a sense of what that looks like. And then Moretto is our latest um, product that's really about coordinating integration across services that might be working on a similar issue and being able to work on the same uh, clients or or coordinate work between organizations or even within organizations if um, if you don't have anything to manage your your client uh, data. All right, so that's us. Um, but with that, I do want to acknowledge uh, the traditional territories I'm joining you from. Again, we're a settler organization um, working with, with and uh, Indigenous peoples across the country. And um, by way of a lot of our work, we always try to take this uh, lens to, uh, to the TRC call to action in all of our work. And, and hopefully that comes through today as well. Um, if, uh, again, Anybody is also interested, and I always do a plug for my uh, my friend, uh, Michael Thad, who is an indigenous artist in Yellowknife, but if anybody is interested in some of this artwork uh, to license it, do let me know. I have a, I have an agreement with Michael that I advertise his work in all of our webinars this year, and I'm, and I will continue to do that. I love this one. This is obviously a, a an image of, of the North, right? So you might recognize this in some of our social media as well. Um, but yeah, let me know if anybody's interested in connecting with them. Now, about today, it's not all help seeker um, and Alina droning on as my as my team likes to call it. My I call it insights, they call it droning. Um, but uh, that today I'm joined by some amazing uh, fellow presenters. So uh, Rob, we've got Rob, we've got Michael and Mariana. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about them as I as I introduce them, of course, and uh, you'll get you'll get much more when when they're up. But uh, just to give you a, a highlight, uh, Rob is a partnership lead with the Central Alberta Child Care Advocacy or Child Advocacy Center. That's a typo there. Pardon us. And he's actually a background in education. So he was a superintendent in, in Red Deer. He'll, again, we'll tell you more about his bio in a second, but he's now working. You know, I think everybody uh, that goes from the education system doesn't really let go when they retire. So this is his post-superintendent uh, post career, but uh, very excellent, excellent speaker on these issues. And you'll hear about that in a second as well. Um, Michael, he's the Director of Learning and Sports Services at Langley School, so that's Langley, BC, and he's going to be talking to you guys about how they're leveraging data and uh, tackling complex uh, youth and uh, mental health challenges in the school systems there actively right now, and uh, again, background in, in the education system as well with, with complex systems, and uh, last but not least, uh, Mariana, who is she says she's not newly minted anymore, but she's been at a Kids Help Phone for about four months as uh, the Chief Innovation Officer. And again, the, the work that KHP is doing in, in the space of data-informed decision-making and leveraging data for um, youth well-being is, is very, very cool. She, her background is actually in the tech sector um, before uh, joining KHP as well. But we'll we'll tell you more about their bio as, as I introduce them as they come up. But just to give you a sense of who's up and the order that they're up. Um, so, to of course do our our part as help seeker, we do want to highlight why we're taking on this webinar and this topic of leveraging data in youth empowerment, and I should say children and youth empowerment. Uh, the big things are um, to look at using data in informed decision making, and that laying of the foundation with evidence. It's you know it's things that we we talk about all the time, but 
often uh, gets really, really difficult to do in practice because we get busy. We don't quite know how the data connects to our day-to-day -day work. So again, hopefully today you're going to walk away with some tips and how to's to mobilize data in your efforts and hopefully to also get convinced that data can be a critical factor in your success too and if you don't have that ingredient you might be missing out on, on some opportunities as well so it's a bit of a pitch to think about data in your practice whether you're a case worker a teacher an administrator right all all the way up to uh, policy systems change all these are they're nested within each other and the way of we use data is different of course but the use of data should be um, happening across the board and so again targeted intervention measuring impact resource allocation trend analysis these are all um, important factors for why we're paying attention to this topic so a couple of notes as well of how folks have been using data analysis techniques for youth empowerment um, big one predictive analytics so using uh, historical data that you might be sitting on so your SERS data or so your um, client information databases etc historical data layering that with some of these predictive analytics tools to say hey do we have some risk factors do we have some patterns here that we can intervene earlier um, without obviously ripping our hairs out doing too much math but is are there quick wins in terms of uh, the data we're already sitting on uh, some of the new innovations in natural language processing. Um, so things, case notes, for instance, are, are unstructured data, uh, text, emails, messages, you know, how uh, people naturally communicate with each other. That all produces data, qualitative data. And in the past, we used to, you know, take forever to do this stuff because I don't know if you any, anybody's ever done qualitative methodology, highlighting, this is a theme, that's a theme. We now have really cool tools that speed that up for us, and they're excelling at that type of analysis. So putting some of that to use to see patterns in that unstructured data is has been really exciting. This is something um, we did in in actually in Langley, I believe, uh, to to find some hidden patterns there. And then of course, machine learning. If you want to get very fancy, and I'll show you some some stuff today that that might kind of inspire you to. To not be scared of machine uh, learning algorithms and essentially, essentially it's just a giant calculator with more complex formulas than than we might be able to do in excel and to be doing that at at scale is is why these algorithms are key social network analysis uh, folks that are already mapping parental or natural support um, relationships you, you know lots about social network analysis you understand the importance of of nodes of support around the child and how critical it is to fill in those gaps where they exist. But social network analysis, when you marry it with some of these new tools, can again find patterns where otherwise you you might not not see. Um, data visualization, nothing nothing is uh, as good as a picture, right? A picture says, tells you a thousand words. Um, but how we communicate these patterns so people understand them and buy into them, and we often talk, you know, um, as researchers. Forget that our audience's visualization needs are very, very specific. So how I would communicate a data trend to a 10-year-old versus a 14-year-old versus an 18-year-old student versus how I would communicate that to their teacher, to the principal of that school, to the um, director of that, of that area, to the policymaker at uh, the provincial level that's distributing funding uh, or making funding decisions is very, very different. So it could be the same stat, but how we show it needs to matter as well. And importantly, is the data mobilization. None of this stuff is interesting if we don't make a change uh, with it or if it doesn't um, it doesn't relate back to, to something new or something that, that we've shifted because of it. So mobilizing the data and how we mobilize the data Oftentimes we we stop at analysis or visualization and kind of assume people are going to get it. And it's like, no, you actually have to breadcrumb all the way through to what this what does this mean for your curriculum? What does this mean for how you talk to the child today in that interaction? What does this mean for how we collect data for this uh, for this particular issue? So just a, a little bit of context for why this matters and how these tools can be of use to you. Um, I did want to take you through some of the youth social data trends and it's children and youth. We're, we're kind of trying to be uh, economical with our slide content. 
Um, but I did want to highlight some of these because there's um, there's not often an opportunity to talk about national trends when it comes to children and youth uh, challenges and uh, COVID. And again, I have so many teacher friends because uh, Travis, uh, my my husband, has been a teacher for had been a teacher for 20 years before we started Health Speaker together. And uh, this this continues to be our dinner time and our our weekend conversations because most of our social network is uh, is teachers or principals in in some cases now. Um, so one of the things that I, I did want to highlight is um, as signals, if you will, signals being things to pay really, really close attention to because they're going to have a major implication on, on child well-being and, and youth well-being in the long run. Um, one of these signals is Canada has risen to have one of the highest rates of adolescent vaping in the world. And I chose this picture of... Um, of uh, vaping products just to show you how similar they are to your 7-Eleven candy that uh, your kid probably has asked for uh, cash to, to go to the store for because they are really targeting uh, through their marketing this younger demographic as well and some really great um, uh, investigative journalism on, on this as well but the the things that are are interesting to me beyond uh, documentaries to to highlight this is what's happening in Canada and so uh, this is, uh, unfortunately, this is kind of the most recent data that we have on the topic, but e-cigarette use in the past 30 days, you can see here um, the, the rates, 11% of grades 7 to 9 and 29% 10 to grades 10 to 12. The, the key message for me here for, for those of us in, in the trenches of this work is that what happens between 7 and 9 and 10 and 12? Uh, and what opportunities do we have for, for interventions there specifically? Um, the other one I wanted to, to show you too is um, that absolutely we see um, these patterns across um, demographics to be quite distinct. So the big one being that adults, this is, this is a youth challenge, not, not an adult uh, challenge. Then I wanted to highlight why this matters, right? So it's, again, interesting fact, cool, thanks. Why do I care, right? Why would I care about this? And the reason we care is because we can see in the in the research on what happens to the brain, uh, brain chemistry and what the short, long-term and um, consequences of, of this is apparent, not apparently, but very well well uh, studied. And I, I pulled one study just to, to highlight it, but um, adolescents experiencing higher reward responses to nicotine and increasing that risk to early addiction, the emotional effects being mixed, uh, increasing slash reducing anxiety, but very, very complex um, brain impacts that this has. The long-term consequences, deficits in cognition, emotional regulation observed in, into adulthood. And again, that, that major change is happening in brain neurochemistry, uh, including dopamine and serotonin levels. Um, why this matters for the long run for us as a society, of course, is that that adolescent nicotine exposure leads to that greater vulnerability. And if folks have been uh, paying attention to what's happening in terms of the fentanyl crisis and uh, polysubstance uses, this exposure to increased risk plus readily available potent uh, illicit substances is, is something we, we have to be concerned about. So uh, signal two. Interestingly, we saw a decline in new substance use during the pandemic but deadly consequences still persist. So I'll, I'll show you a couple of stats on that. Um, this is grade sevens and nines uh, and 10 to 12. So the darker one is use uh, in, again, 2018, 19, um, before the pandemic. This has been decreasing uh, over time. And what, what's again of note is the differences in, in terms of what folks are consuming. And again, the jump. Right, the jump between grade sevens and nines and 10 to 12, pointing out that indeed there's there's opportunities, there's there's obviously um, more peer pressure, there's additional availability, et cetera. Um, past 12 months, in terms of what, uh, what types of substances are being used by grades, uh, you can see here the synthetics, right? And cannabinoids, which are, are now legalized, uh, yay <laughs> or not. Um, and hallucinogenic as well. So back to the uh, vulnerability of youth and what they're uh, consuming. This is a this tells you quite a bit about their the susceptibility of of um, of youth as they as they age into adulthood. 
So again, increase in reports of anxiety, depression, and stress, uh, and combine that with the complex role of social media um, and the, the negative effects of cyberbullying, you're, you're starting to kind of put these patterns together. What are these signals telling us? Um, the emergence of these synthetic drugs. So, you know, yes, fentanyl, but also ketamine, also trank, also xylazine. These are substances that are now layered on top of these risk factors that to be 100% fair did not even exist uh, 10 years ago. So it's a very different time for um, growing up, um, especially having gone through the pandemic as a generation. Um, signal three, and I did wanna uh, put a note here about the social media, um, the expression, connection, and cruelty impacts of that. Um, social media and the types of uh, social media platforms kids are using are, again, uh, interesting to know. And are we present in these in these platforms? YouTube, Facebook, believe it or not, Facebook, the, the one that your grandma uses, apparently still a thing. Uh, TikTok, Insta, Snapchat, Twitter, WhatsApp, Discord. Of course, certain things are, are gaining ground and their uh, Xbox Live Discord are uh, ones that for sure my kid is personally on as well that we're keeping, a, keeping an eye out on. But are we intervening in these platforms? Do we have strategies around our YouTube content and how we're monitoring that content, if that's where kids spend their time. Um, the other piece, too, that I thought was of note, uh, percentage of youth owning uh, smartphones, and this is, uh, Travis and I have arguments about, you know, do, does get, Reese get a phone or not, does, and he's 9 to 11, and uh, it's like, well, all my friends have it, 57% say, right, uh, 18, um, or 81% for 12 to 13 year olds, and 93, by the time they leave high school, everybody has one, right? Uh, Reese does not have a smartphone, but only because I'm cheap. Uh, and Slash, um, also, also seeing uh, some of these connections between, uh, here we go, some of these connections between when the kid first got a smartphone and some of these other social indicators, uh, for instance, and Kids Help Phone and us were looking at some of these stats, the association between the age when the kid first receives a smartphone and the susceptibility to um, to body image challenges and eating disorders. We know the longer you delay the smartphone, research suggests the, the lower the risk of these um, body image and eating disorder risks. So I'm just gonna try to keep the phone out of his hands for another year. And, and you know, it, it's not gonna be a bad thing, right? It, that's as a parent. Um, Online cruelty experiences, I did want to say um, to, uh, to all of us that, that are dealing with this, that there are, of course, intersectionality aspects to this that need to be taken into account. Uh, the overall um, online cruelty reports for Canadian youth are at 32%, but we can see uh, diverse youth experiences at higher rates, in the, in the, especially in the case of gender diverse youth or, or youth with a disability having the highest, interestingly. And we, we often don't talk about uh, youth with um, with neurodivergence or youth with uh, physical uh, disabilities and, and what that means. Obviously, we see it in the classroom all the time. Inclusive learning, which, which it challenges us to, to do a better job of it. How much are we doing that online is, is an interesting, it's an interesting question. Um, oops. And last but not least, um, making a point about where the online cruelty is experienced. And this kind of blew my mind a little bit because uh, you always assume it's going to be in those Insta, Insta messages telling you you're, you know, uh, fat shaming, et cetera. But it's actually in online games is the highest one. Uh, obviously, we've got the other elements as well, posts on social networks, comments on social networks, for sure. But on online games, right? In online games, and I'm, I'm not sure where we're monitoring that as, as closely as we, as we could, could be or talking to our kids about, about that as well. So a couple of notes about, about that. Um, the fourth signal um, is really about uh, these, again, I, I referenced them before as well, the eating uh, disorder uh, increases as well. And I pulled uh, these pre and post pandemic. Again, we don't have 2023. That's just the, the life we live in in terms of, in terms of um, data availability. But what we do know is 2019 uh, and to 20, um, the eating disorder rates per capita, per 100,000, was 14. Post-pandemic, it's more than double that, 30, right? So that is that is a 
big signal. That's a strong signal. Okay, and so what's what's going on? And here you can see again the that 10 to 14, um, the difference, look at that, the difference between um, these uh, age brackets as well. Interestingly, the five to nine is decreased, but every specifically the 10 to 14 goes from 14 to 30, and the 15 to 17 year olds go from 28 to 56. That is unbelievable. So again, major, major, major signals, like all these things layer on top of each other. Um, I have one more here too, uh, to, to note that 60% hospitalizations for eating disorder, uh, that's been the increase for women aged 10 to 17 since March, 2020. So these are, these are telling us things are, things are definitely, uh, shifting in some concerning directions. Um, but on the other hand, interesting fact at the same time is we actually saw suicide rates decline. So all these signals are, are telling us that something is, is a foot that's, that's negative pressures on, on use. Yet one of the a core signal in society that, that we always monitor is suicide rates. And those have been declining, which is very puzzling, right, from a data perspective. And so here's a, a quick view of uh, what that suicide rate looks like over the years. And we pulled just zero to 24 year olds. We can break it down if anybody's interested, but just for visualization's sake. Um, and you can see since um, 2000, right? Some major, major gains, right? So we would say, this is a good news story. If you remember when cigarettes, um, cigarette decline happened, right? That, that was exciting. We, it was a win for public health. So we might say, you know, something is going great, right? We're doing something right on this, that these, these declines are being observed at the population level. Um, and that's, that's awesome news. However, just like uh, nicotine, old school cigarettes have been declining. You guys see that vaping. So these other products are now, they're eating into those gains that we made as from a public health perspective in previous decades. So the same way that e-cigarettes are reversing our wins on cigarettes, these other risk factors that we're talking about around social media, around the availability of synthetics, the types of pressures young people are experiencing, these two threaten to impact the gains we may have made in the suicide rates. Um, I did wanna also make the point that suicide rates are have a gendered aspect. And so the male rates are significantly, as you can see here, higher, for zero to 24 year olds than they are for females. And so what gives, right? What explains some of these things? And so we wanted to, uh, let's give you guys a little poll here and you can just do it the old school way by dropping things in the chat. Um, we did a little experiment, just it sounds so weird to say just for fun, but it's, we wanted to do a quick experiment yesterday to see what, um, what might be associated with these factors. So we just went into our data repository and ran one of these algorithms that we're talking about to say, hey, um, let's just pick 30 uh, indicators across demographics. So things like age groups, employment insurance, like does EI make a difference? Uh, immigrant status of the family, uh, gender of the parent, right? Is a female or male parent? The marital status, are they divorced, separated, et cetera? What about housing tenure, owning, renting? Housing affordability, is it uh, kids in core housing need, right? Low income kids, kids where there's government transfers, employment income. So question to you guys, out of these factors, just drop it in the chat and I'm just super curious. Um, are suicide rates also decreasing? I don't have that on me, um, but, uh, but I'm happy to get that Genevieve because um, we, Sometimes they do have those rates, but not always publicly available is the problem. Um, so take a take a look at these and just throw me some some text in the type in the chat and see what you think. Which of these factors do you think? Okay, we got addictions, financial stress, negative outlook on the future, uh, housing affordability, housing tenure. Okay, any other guesses? Government transfers, socioeconomic status, EI, financial, socioeconomic, uh-huh, 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 immigrant, yeah, okay, socioeconomics, yeah, we didn't test everything, we tested these, just these ones that were up here, um, so I'm, this is, by no means, this is not like a, you know, housing, EI, 
housing, marital status, immigrant, interesting, demographics, marital status, interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so I'll, let's see, I'll show you. All right, so the big shocker to us, okay, why can't I go to the next one? Okay, oops. Oh, yeah, that's just a note. We didn't we didn't dig into everything, right? Because the data wasn't available to us, right? But um, we did dig into those uh, socioeconomic demographic links. And so things like age, shelter, income show no direct correlation to suicide rates based on the uh, regression analysis. So what the age, right? How, how does this work? Why not? Um, so we, we said, let's go a little bit deeper. And we said, let's test other data that we might have access to. So we also ran uh, Google search behaviors online against those suicide rates over, over that time period. And, and so here's the thing. There, we did find a strong uh, correlation, negative correlation um, between Google search trends for mental health and suicide rates, AKA when mental health searches increase, suicide rates tend to decrease. Okay, so like just like, okay, so why this matters? That matters because mental health and awareness and intervention might actually <laughs> impact suicide rates. So we, we can actually see a correlation between people looking for help, the accessibility of those resources and potential impacts on population level health risks. Um, obviously this is just, just again, a, a kind of initial step in this direction, but that would tell us that those targeted interventions and our ability to play in the online digital space, and of course, using data to make decisions on these other good things matters, right? So you, the work we do matters is, is the important part. Um, so that's, that's just something that was uh, amazing for me to know because oftentimes we feel like we're, you know, we're just spinning our wheels, that these systemic issues we can get ahead of, and these, these issues are gonna continue to kind of plague society well past our efforts in our, in our work. And what this suggests is, what if it, what if we can shift these metrics and shift the tide for for young people? What else could we do um, through these targeted interventions and, and policy and coordinated efforts uh, for young people? So I thought, you know, this might be a, a good message to leave you with um, as we also um, introduce you to some of the speakers who are doing that work on the ground as well. So. Um, with that in mind, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Rob to to take us away for for his um, presentation, and we'll yeah we'll look forward to your your next insights. Thanks so much, Alina. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here today with everyone and uh, to share the CAC, the Central Alberta Child Advocacy Center, and the journey that we've been on for the last seven years, which I've been a part of for a year and a half. Um, I feel like we were, we're doing some amazing things. And when I say that, I don't speak about myself so much as the, the people that I work with, including three full-time uh, RCMP members that do the forensic interviews each and every day. So a quick bio for myself is simply, um, I'm the partnership lead here at, uh, at the CAC. And, and what that simply means is I'm working with uh, Red Deer Polytechnic mostly and doing curriculum integration and working on all the concepts that would be related to an advocacy center, obviously dealing with trauma, trauma-informed, but also just like the Child First Act and all those pieces that uh, come to, come into effect so that every Red Deer Polytechnic student eventually will graduate and understand what child advocacy is all about. Uh, I put on and help put on with a, a crew of people at conference every year, a shameless plug that's on me. 28th and 29th, which Alina will be speaking at, along with a mixture of people from across Canada dealing with child advocacy work. And uh, finally, building a research hub, which I'll be speaking about, and is some exciting pieces coming our way. Um, and, and this was not asked of me, but I'm going to do it anyway. A uh, shameless plug, plug for Alina and the Health Help Seeker crew. Um, it's been transformational for us in our journey. I, I, I felt like as a um, a former associate superintendent, um, I kind of knew a little bit about uh, the work on research and data. And uh, coming here, I was met her, and I was completely humbled and and <laughs> in a great way. 
Uh, she's the next level of all these pieces, and um, I advocate for her everywhere I go. Um, quick, quick piece about my personal life that I find very exciting lately is well, I have a wife of 35 years, three kids that are all married. One that I think is on the online right now, just to give me a critique on how I'm doing, I think, at the end. And uh, But um, I'm a grandpa for the first time and uh, for four days now, and I just got a, a picture of him and he's at home and, and healthy and uh, large. He's very large. So I'm very excited. That's a whole new experience that uh, you haven't experienced it yet. Um, I wasn't ready for it and how it would make you feel. So I'm pretty excited about that. Okay. Um, I'm going to stick, I will stick to my 10 minute allotment here for sure. Um, 10 years ago, um, there were, unfortunately, as some of these things go, several youth, uh, two of which I actually coached in hockey that uh, took their life. And there was a span of about two or three years in Red Deer where we had a lot of kids that um, did this, I guess, like several. And it was an epidemic and it was being talked about in the news across Alberta, but even in Canada, and uh, a room full of people finally said, enough is enough. Let's do something about this. And one of the people in the room was a co-principal. I was a principal at the time, and his name was Mark Jones. And uh, he's a very dynamic person. And he sat in a room with several people, and they said, let's do something about this. But what did they do? Uh, they knew mental health was an issue, and, and it wasn't talked. It was starting to be talked about, but not talked about significantly. So the room full of people knew they wanted to do something. And one of the people in the room, um, Terry is his name, he had a connection. He played hockey with Sheldon Kennedy. And uh, for everyone that's tuning in, I'm, I'm quite certain that most people know what Sheldon Kennedy is and who he is and the work that he was doing. And so they had a conversation uh, with Sheldon and said, what do we do, Sheldon? We have these people. We want to do something. We're not going to, we're going to grab hold. We're going to do something for our community. And he said, let me take you to a place. And so they went to the uh, Child Advocacy Center in uh, Calgary. And he said, this is what you need to do. So Mark and a small group of people started with uh, an employment of two people that were doing it basically on a volunteer basis. And, and this uh, CAC was started with two people in 2017. And uh, so they've been working since 2017. I'm going to show you some stats in a moment about the work that we've done since 2017. And uh, we've grown significantly. I, we're probably around 15 to 20 employees now. But they came up with an idea. And so they moved around two or three times to different locations. And they grew slowly. It was a very small operation, small space. And uh, they grew slowly. Uh, but then the idea came is, let's, let's build a business model. Because some of the people that came on board to begin with were business-minded. Let's, let's build a building. Let's, let's, let's make this building. And let's put the child advocacy on the third floor. And, uh, and so they, they did that. They thought about it and they went, okay, the plans were in, in place. And they said, let's have tenants that would pay rent. And so we'll build it, we'll be a part of it, but let's build a business model so the operations and programming could be sustainable. And I think the idea started with 15,000 square feet, then it grew to 20. And as we increased in tenants, which I'll be sharing with you because it's integral to our model, our multidisciplinary model and our model for putting all the mental health supports in one spot, not all, but a significant amount of them within our Red Deer area. Um, so that we decided to do that. We grew from 15 to 25 to 50,000. We're now in 70, what we ended up with is a 70,000 square feet. And um, everyone that's here is dealing with mental health concerns in some capacity. So it's the Sheldon Kennedy Center of Excellence. And it's the CACAC, which I'm a part of. We're on the third floor completely. There's the building, and it is that beautiful, or maybe even more beautiful. I look out over a pond and some trees. We're on the Red Deer Polytechnic campus between the Gary Harris um, Center and the Red Deer Polytechnic campus. And so it's about 60 steps to either door. And uh, we also have embedded in our, or in our building the Central Alberta Sexual Assault Support Center. We have Alberta Health Services Move Your Mood, which is dealing with moving your mood with uh, with dealing with mental health. And that's a spectrum that deals with uh, from children all the way up to seniors. And, and that's a really exciting enterprise. Uh, they have some really neat and innovative things happening on that second floor. I'm always down there because it's also virtual reality type pieces to a, a yogurt and smoothie bar and they keep adding things and, and it's a really dynamic spot. Uh, we have the Lindsay Moore 
child and youth mental health and addictions uh, therapy, and they they provide ther they'll be providing therapy for um, um, anyone within our region and zone four. And when I speak about the central Alberta area, it's zone four. If you're familiar with that in Alberta, if not, you can look it up, and it'll be one of your first hits. You can see what the zone encompasses in the communities from Sylvan Lake, Innisfail, Lacombe, and, and surrounding areas. And finally, we have on the uh, that those those would be on the second floor. And then finally, on the third floor, we have the Step Up, Step Down, which has 16 full time treatment beds. And the neat piece, the neat part about that is it's a it's a live in piece with mental health concerns, and it's on site and it's therapeutic and it's a three month stay. Sometimes it's two months, sometimes it's five or six months. And it's a family treatment center. And what it has is mental health aides, social worker, occupational therapists, recreational therapists, family therapists, uh, and a physicians and support youth treatment family goals. So um, that's sort of what's in our building. Now, the goal for what we're doing and the vision that we're trying to create within this Selwyn Kennedy Center of Excellence is a vibrant community to combat child abuse through education, prevention, and best practices. And what we're hoping for is, and it's already happening because half of us have moved in, uh, what's happening with our community is as we're even connecting with each other over the lunch table, uh, we, have a, we have a dog and a dog handler here is one example that happened last week. And someone from the Step Up, Step Down said, hey, we have one of our kids going to court. Would you mind supporting with your dog? And we did. And some of the connections that are happening between are, are seamless. A lot of our, our, our clients that come here um, are, are, are getting supports through Alberta Health Services Mental Health and also the Sexual Assault Center. And the wait time was probably three and four and five months, and it's now down to a month, just because of the seamless way we're now working together. So that's pretty exciting. Okay, um, moving on to the next piece here, um, uh, the next slide and talking about some of our pillars. Uh, we're, we, we have about three there. One of them would be innovation. And Innovation, so our goal since the very beginning was to use data, data and best practices to be a leader in the service that we provide for, for youth and children. So that became one of the cornerstones early on. And, and, it, and the reason it became that was because Sheldon Kennedy talked about that from his first moments of being involved with us. He said, you need to use the data that's there. You need to find a way to pull on the same rope together. Don't start this all over again, but you need to use the data so you can help prevent child abuse. Uh, number two would be collaboration. We deal with in our multidisciplinary table and, and every day there's an intake session that's probably about an hour long. We talk about all of our clients and we, we share pieces that will help lend to um, what would be a recovery or best services provided for each client. And at the table is Alberta Health Services, the RCMP, Children's Services, our advocates from our team and the education team, all sharing information for the benefit of the child. Um, so, and the last one would be trauma. Providing a safe and inclusive spaces here is a very important part of our, we have really interesting fi family rooms. We have three family rooms. We also have a prayer room that has a, a smudging area. So um, we, we're inclusive and diverse and make sure that we're covering all those pieces. All right, so the next piece, um, the data's impact. Well, I should probably just talk about the data's impact just for a moment and talking about that we've already served 9,000 as you can see, 9,000 children since 2017 and reaching almost half a million people across that, including the 10 Treaty 6 First Nations reserves. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is that when I started a year and a half, we were probably seeing somewhere around 15 clients a month. And our numbers are now 50 to 60 clients a month and then a year and a half since I, I have even started. All right. Um, so looking at the data-informed decision-making model, uh, making decisions uh, for our service, that's what we use our data for, for service for provision, for policy, ensuring that we have accurate, accurate data to make our best decisions possible. That's really important for us. Um, comprehensive data analysis. Um, this was something that was just absolutely mind-blowing to me the first time that uh, I, I dealt with Help Seeper, but they've been able to help us to collate and make sense of our data available to our CAC. Uh, we've been using it to help our communities, to help them understand their complex needs and where we need to further investigate and help provide supports. It tells us and allows us to know where we're at and where we need to spend more time. For instance, uh, when we did some of the deep digging and looking through, just as Elena did in the, the slides before, we were able to focus in and go, why is there this area of town? Why is this, why is there this close? Why do we have so many kids in this close? 
but it helps us to zero in on even just supports for schools and school divisions to say, hey, um, awareness, uh, making sure that staffs then and school staff in, in those areas were aware of what child advocacy was all about, signs and symptoms, and we're able to actually just be so much more effective in targeting awareness and education and those pieces for prevention. The risk index development. So we've used the, the data to highlight high-risk youth and children in our communities based on the data. We've been able to take certain subsections of our data and help it just to real and reveal more of the story so we can provide support. And what it does in that, that, that deeper dive into that data is help us to move, remove and just be able to look at more of the root causes of pieces. And what happens is, is the story starts to be revealed. And we've just been beginning this journey with all of this information because I'm sitting, it's sitting here beside me, pages and pages, and I've gone through it time and time again, and it's amazing. Like the type of uh, patterns that we've been able to pull and what we're going to be able to pull. Um, so empirical folks using data to reveal the story. All right, so why data matters? It can help us prevent future cases to intervene faster. And we're building a data-led integrated class model Simply stated, we wish to end child abuse and focus on the evidence-based strategies for high yield um, effectiveness so that we can, we can accent our prevention, education, and awareness. Okay, um, I would like to talk quickly about um, the next piece, which is uh, just on April the 12th. Uh, we're gonna be report, re releasing our reports on the state of child well-being. Uh, we're gonna have mayors, school superintendents, leadership, RDP leadership, um, all stakeholders with, with Children's Services, um, RCMP and Alberta Health Services. And we're going to be coming together on April the 12th to sort of look at factors that are impacting their community and find ways to work together and collaborate together. We're really excited about this project because if we can get everyone in our communities together and share data and share insights, we're going to be able to really make strong inroads in the prevention piece. Uh, Data-driven community outreach. We'll be using that data to be able to assist our communities to build a strategy and work through issues as we're discovered. And we hope to be able to use and share this data with each other so we can go to each community to share their specific issues and help each one of them. Um, advocacy through the insight. Uh, mentioned before, we use our, our findings and our policy to, for system change. And finally, the data sharing hub. This is something that we're so excited to, to, be, to be formulating. We're gonna be visiting data hubs across Canada so we're gonna be able to find all of our areas and all of the organizations, including ourselves, to work together. Um, one of the neat, unique stories is that we went to, we go to each community and as you can see in front of you, uh, each one of them were able to share insights from each community and tell them where that with risk factors, we can tell them where they're at with um, their demographics, their information for every part of their community. And that's been really integral. So this community didn't know much about us. And after we were there and sort of shared all of this data and trending pieces with them, it was incredible because they were able to look at that and really get on board. They then came for a tour of the CACAC and now I'd call them a dynamic partner. So going from uh, not knowing us to just showing this information in their community and coming to visit, we now have a very dynamic partner in our community. And finally, I would just say Help Seekers has been transformational for us and helping us to see what was buried in our system, but we weren't utilizing. And it's brought to service the most important issues and concerns so that we're finding solutions for our children. So thank you very much for your time. It was very pleasurable. Thanks. Thanks so much, Rob. And yes, I, I will send that, that copy. Uh, for the for the plugs, the shameless plugs, thanks. <laughs> really kind. Um, we uh, we have a quick change um, over to give uh, to give Mariana the floor next, um, just because she's she's got to uh, bounce after her uh, presentation. So I'll uh, I'll let her share her screen, and uh, we'll we'll push push uh, the agenda forward here. There we go. You're up, Mariana. Thank you so much, um, Alina. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'll, I'll try and stick to my, my 10 minute uh, allotted time. Um, that was a great presentation, uh, Michael. I'd love to, to connect with you. So uh, we'll definitely have lots to share together. Um, so for those of you who don't know Kids Health Phone, um, we are, uh, you know, we are a, a 24 seven, um, uh, resource for youth and for us youth is ages 5 to 29 
And since the beginning of 2020, which is when COVID hit, we've had over 18 million interactions uh, in various forms. We do this by phone, text, uh, and then peer-to-peer -peer on, our, on our website. Um, we offer services in about 100 uh, different languages, and we have a number of programs, uh, as well as our 24-7 uh, line uh, that includes in schools, in um, crisis response centers, et cetera. And we have launched the largest uh, community resource database, we call it RAM, um, resource around me last uh, recently in March. Uh, we will be adding a mental health apps uh, database. So this allows both our uh, counselors frontline of which we have uh, over 200 plus 3000 volunteers across the country providing uh, services to access the latest uh, and best resources uh, to refer youth uh, to, as they call in or, or contact us. Uh, we focus on equity seeking communities uh, with uh, supporting Inuit, First Nations and Métis, as well as uh, the black youth through our Rise Up program. Um, and more recently with our newcomer youth. So all we do is uh, designed with uh, with youth, uh, by youth, and uh, we have a, a methodology to engage them through our uh, design process. Uh, we have changed the landscape of e-mental health in Canada uh, since we started 35 years ago. We did virtual care, in fact, uh, 35 years ago when no one was using the telephone uh, to deliver services, we were already there. This gives you some of the, the data points uh, and the volume of data points that we are sitting on. Uh, and our data, unlike a research database or a clinical electronic health record is real time. And it's about what are kids saying and what's going on, uh, whether it's around uh, wildfires going on or the pandemic or any other of those issues. We've launched uh, new programs as we proceeded to adjust uh, to the, the changing landscape of youth. In many communities, we are the only thing in town. So uh, recently our board uh, had a, their board meeting in Iqaluit and we met some youth for whom, you know, they live in, in a one room home and uh, we are it because they can't get on the phone to talk to anybody when their family's around. So they can text us any time of day. Uh, so in many communities, we are the only game in town uh, for supporting them. We have a step care model uh, and all the, the levels of, of care that this provides and youth can choose whether they get peer to peer support on our website all the way to reaching a counselor one on one. All this fuels our data warehouse um, that we have been building over the, the many years that we've been in existence. So. We know that youth are in crisis and we have uh, very strong data to, to tell us who is that is calling. Um, and to the point earlier, for example, we know that uh, you know, suicide rates for Indian youth are about 24 times uh, the national average. So we're able to dissect uh, by population. Um, and you can see that uh, you know 10% identified as indigenous of those calling in, 6% as black, and 9% as newcomers. So we have uh, we have the data of who's calling and what uh, populations they belong to. So we're able to dissect it. And 71% of kids who called us shared something that they would not have shared with anyone else. And we were able to prevent close to 10% of ER admissions because uh, they, they called us. Um, so as we're looking at all this data, we have over 40 million messages and uh, we're averaging about 5 million annual interactions as well as uh, we do a lot of QA and surveys with our frontline uh, staff. So we have just finished our data hub at the end of last year. And we've been working with AI, actually since 2017, our AI triages uh, suicidality and escalates to the right uh, level and, and, and much faster. But since then we've been building other AI models, which I'll tell you about in, in a minute and Help Seeker has been a partner uh, there. So we're really now this year focused on uh, <clears throat> uh, issuing significant insight reports out of our data. 
but even today, today we just got a big request from a provincial government. Often uh, policymakers uh, will reach out to us when they need to understand what's going on in real time uh, in their province or even uh, federally. Some of the work we've been doing with our data and AI, and this is a particular project we're proud to have done with uh, help seekers, um, is to identify service uh, deserts and overload, overload points. And the goal is to do this across the country, but we've done a prototype with uh, Saskatoon. So this allows us to map what services are available in certain regions of, of the country um, to the, the, the need or demand that's there. Our hope is that as we roll this out throughout the country, not only are we able to target areas that are not getting um, services as much as uh, an urban city might, but areas that we can also inform, again, governments and policymakers at all levels, whether it's municipal, provincial, or um, federal, where they might want to allocate mental health resources uh, for youth. So this project is underway and, and we're really excited about it. The other project that we're undertaking, uh, we already have a prototype build where we're using uh, AI to develop trend, uh, trend spotting dashboards. Um, so we are doing what's called social listening, um, you know, whether it's in social media, news, message boards, and we're looking at our service data. So we're starting to identify where uh, their patterns of utilization and what they're about. So in the future, to uh, we want to get to a predictive, uh, the ability to get uh, to a predictive stage with, with our data combined with environmental data. Uh, lastly, we just launched a new um, clinical services platform uh, called Acelo, and we did this actually with another not for profit for profit tech company uh, out of California, they're called Tech Matters. And the reason this is very unique is that the counselor is able to provide all services in one platform, they don't have to switch. Uh, but also at the back end, there's very rich data that we are able to capture in the form of both unique data points from surveys, but also um, from the text transcripts that we are able to, to retain. Uh, we've developed a partnership uh, with the Vector Institute uh, last year, and we have built uh, a, a model that allows us to identify from regular language, to Alina's earlier point on natural processing language, from the natural language that the youth are using, what is their main issue? So by the time they get to a counselor, they will already know whether this is an anxiety situation or you know, whichever other clinical uh, um, prediction there is. And we're still testing it, but to date it's shown to be more, uh, more than 90% of the com conversations, they identify the key issue. Uh, we continue to test this with the frontline staff and hope to go live with it uh, later in the year. So with Vector, uh, we're continuing to go down the AI journey and we have, you know, to date a commitment that we're not going to replace humans to do the frontline counselor, but AI is very much the aid to either be more effective as a frontline user or perhaps uh, to provide very better information out of our RAM to the youth that are contacting us. And lastly, um, we continue to tackle a lot of our issues around innovation and partnerships, and we have so many partnerships, but we recently launched a challenge with Elevate and Mars. We're currently uh, raising the funds, but the idea is that together we will issue a challenge to the tech, uh, AI, and entrepreneur ecosystem to develop solutions uh, to Alina's earlier data point if, if the issue is that kids are in games and that's where uh, the stresses are coming from, we want that community to come up to solutions that we can find uh, our youth in games and service them uh, from there. Uh, so we want to make sure they're being directed to positive and constructive uh, supports rather than what they might find through social media. Um, so I'll stop there. Our journey ahead is very, very exciting. 
and uh, we're looking uh, to move into next year by launching an innovation and applied research hub uh, that will bring together for-profit private sector technology uh, companies, as well as um, uh, government and uh, the passion and knowledge that uh, Kids Health Phone has brought to the table to date. Awesome. Thank you so much. I didn't even know half of the stuff you guys were and I did it in 10 minutes. Just you saying. did. You did. Yeah. It's, you know, you've done a, probably a lot of startup pitches in your career in the tech sector, too. I'm, yeah, that's excellent information. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to call up um, colleague uh, Michael Morgan. He's uh, just a quick bio about him. Director of Learning Sports Services at the Langley School District. And uh, previous roles include district principal on Aboriginal education uh, and a teacher in BC Public and First Nation schools. So um, really excited to, to hear about your insights as well. And I'll be I'll be advancing your, your slides uh, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, but yeah, if you'd like to say hello and we'll take it from here. Hello, everybody. It says I can't start my video because somebody else got to be in charge of it. So. <laughs> well, we'll figure that out. Excellent. We, yeah, uh, we'll figure that out. Oh, wait, it says the co-host has, has asked. Uh, thanks. Let's see. Is that <laughs> work? Yeah. yeah, you're up now. You're good. Thank you very much. It's a it's a real honor to be here. Um, and thank you for your time. Uh, I'm in the city of Langley, which uh, resides on the unceded Ancestral traditional territories of the Kwantlen, Katsi, Matsqui, and Semiamu First Nations. Um, I'll be, I'll do it just as well. I'll do, I'll do nine minutes. Uh, on to the next slide, please. I'd uh, like to talk a little bit about project resiliency, uh, what that was and still is for our district. So we base it on those four questions, universally designed questions of a professional learning community. So what do we want all students in Langley to have and why is it important? And we want them to have the ability to respond to their environment in ways that increase their mental well-being based on their own strengths and resources. So project resiliency, uh, I can take zero credit for it. Uh, groundbreaking work 15 years ago where we brought in mental health clinicians who would work with students um, around uh, that question. Do they have the ability to respond to their environment? Um, and then that next question of a universal, uh, universal designed uh, professional learning community question is how will we know if they have it? And at the time that Project Resiliency started, what they began to do was gather data about the student themselves, all of the challenges they were facing and all of the struggles that they had in addition to this inventory of resources that they had available to them. I'd like to give a big shout out uh, to Christine. One of the things in Langley that we are blessed with is uh, community partners who work very, very closely together. So Project Resiliency students come for three days. Uh, they work with our mental health clinicians. Uh, if you hear screaming in the background, I'm in a school, so... Uh, <laughs> everybody uh you can you can get to enjoy the kids learning um and so the mental health clinicians would work with the students uh do just what i had said before and then they would provide those students uh, they would help those students to develop an action plan for themselves which they would then take back to their schools the interesting thing about project resiliency is that uh, and the people who started it and their you know real vision has led to us being one of the few school districts in British Columbia that have mental health clinicians working directly in our schools. We currently have 17 mental health clinicians who work directly uh, in our elementary, middle, and secondary schools. Um, so the building, we started to meet help seekers, and this isn't a plug for help, help seekers, but it is. I guess they haven't asked me to do it, but I will. Um, the Building Safer Community Funds, if you can uh, head over, to the other slide, Alina. Um, this idea, um, the Building Safer Community Funds, the idea of addressing root causes and supporting initiatives and then expanding youth programs and long-term well-being. Um, Rob said that he was humbled by the data that Help Seekers was able to show with them. For me, uh, it made me give up sports betting forever 
because when I realized the amount of information that sports betting uh, companies had, I stood no chance of ever winning a bet on a regular basis. So I stopped cold turkey there, but there was an aha moment for me of we don't actually know the truth about our student data because the truth is that um, by which we look at from every angle and every perspective it looks the same. Help Seekers was able to take our data that we had been collecting for 15 years and show us patterns that we had never seen. And what ended up happening, uh, if we can move to the next slide, um, we worked with help seekers alongside with the city and township of Langley applying for this grant. And what came back to us was our community, again, has this huge strength in its ability to offer services and work together. And the data showed us that project resiliency was working really, really well. It just wasn't able to service enough kids. We hadn't grown it in 15 years. But taking that data, and that data was on paper, um, a lot of it was, you know, uh, files uh, folded away. Uh, by taking that data, we took a look and what uh, the city and the township agreed is that the grant would better be served, uh, be better served with us at the school district and that we would grow project resiliency. So we took project resiliency and moved it. Uh, project resiliency still exists, but what we then did uh, was create Project Blackfeather with this idea that through outreach, we would be able to serve more students. So the data then showed us that Project Resiliency was able to service the students who are in school right now. It is not able to service the students who have been significantly disconnected from schools. So the exciting part now is we have four uh, outreach workers and uh, mental health clinicians separate from project uh, uh, from project resiliency working in project black feather in terms of uh, providing services to connect those students to their schools doing the exact same work that project resiliency uh, has done um if we can move on to the next uh, slide here's what the next steps look like uh, for us uh, we're working with help seekers um, as part of our contract with the federal government, the township and the city to uh, develop program evaluation for Project Black Feather. Did it do what we said it would do? But we're also looking at um, how, uh, how can we use data within our school district to really be a catalyst for equity. So I go back to those four uh, universal design questions of a professional learning community. What do we all want all students to have? How will we know if they have it or not? Uh, the next exciting steps is what will we do when we don't have it? And I think one of the things that really is a catalyst for equity is when we say, what we want all kids to have is non-negotiable. When we're clear about that, we take out the bias of the system, we take out the bias of the individual. And we can then measure whether students have those things and whether they are able uh, to do those things. And then through predictive uh, measures, we might actually be able to say, here are the evidence-based interventions that can work. Let's apply them. Let's see if they work for these specific students. And if they don't work, what in our context could work? So really using that data to show us what the true measure uh, is for our students and show and then possibly predict for us uh, what we could be doing uh, together. Um, and that would be our next slide, the comprehensive data for tailored salute strategies. Uh, we're currently working with help seekers. I think they're, uh, some of their staff members are out here this week. Um, and they're going to look at with us what data we do have. How can we put it in one central place so that everybody's eyes are on it so that we can then provide uh, much quicker interventions 
uh, and answer those four questions of the of a professional learning community, uh, ideally with that uh, catalyst for equity. Uh, really honored to be here. <laughs> As speaking with all those, uh, speaking with all of you, and thanks for having me today. I can't believe you did it in nine minutes. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you so much, and we're super honored. And you guys, you really didn't have to say that about us. That's really, really kind. And thank you. Uh, you're doing all the cool work. We just get to like grind data for you to tell you. And the cool part is when we see folks listen to the data. I love that. Love that. It's making the changes because. You know, it gives meaning to, for us too, right? Because we sometimes feel like we're doing a bunch of research and nobody nobody really cares, but to actually see, you know, change happen with data is like, it's rewarding for us. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So I think we actually have some time for questions. Thanks to uh, presenters that were so uh, so on time. That's amazing. And um, I, I do have a, a couple of ones that have come in. I'll, I'll just stop sharing my screen because we can then see each other if, and we'll we'll see what we can we can take away. Um, one of the the interesting ones, and this one actually came from one of our uh, buddies that is a still a teacher. He's actually leading some of the indigenous work um, in in one of the uh, I won't say which city, but you can probably guess because we don't want to out him too much. But he wants to know whether anybody's done any work mobilizing data with actual youth, like putting the data itself in front of youth. And if any, uh, if anybody's done any of that and, and what insight you might've had. So I, I don't know, um, Mariana or Mike, Michael, go ahead. Yeah, great question. Uh, we, uh, out of a tragedy that you may have read about in the in the news uh, we lost a student um, through a really tragic uh, event that uh, turned out to be manslaughter um, one of our students um, died of a drug overdose after being uh, given way too many drugs by um, a former student of us uh, we started what was called the youth engagement program and at that point in time we uh, listened to as many uh, youth as we could um, and then took back their information, shared it with our partners in the community. And then we took back to um, the youth, here are all of the things that we now know about. That actually led to the work that we did with help seekers through Project Resiliency, giving up that data. And then we shared that data back to that same group of students um, and said, this is what our data is saying. Is it close? Um, and I can't share that information with you because it's information that we said we would not uh, share. The, um, um, but that's the stat, that's the process that we were able to take. Take the data that help seekers had shown us, send it back to our youth and say, you know, are we looking at the same thing you are? Um, and so youth voice is playing a huge role in, in what it is we are doing. Very cool. That's Awesome. I'm too bad I can't find out what they said, but it's next time. So, next. Alina, to, uh, as I mentioned uh, briefly in my presentation, um, we do likely almost monthly youth engagement sessions, and many of them last year we engaged about 150 youth uh, in designing and informing our direction, both in innovation and in terms of what we're doing with AI, uh, et cetera as well as having youth councils. So they, we have a national youth council an indigenous youth council and a black youth council. Um, and they, again, we reach out to them and they're part of uh, all of our solutions as, as we move forward. So um, engaging around the future of data and insights is, is, uh, is something that we will continue to do. Rob, any, anything to share? Yeah, nothing to this point, but we definitely have a plan to uh, correlate and hopefully find former clients and be able to sort of have a information uh, gathered in that forum so we can find out ways that how they felt safe here, to, you know, asking those kind of questions. Yeah, excellent. So it does piggyback onto another um, another question that we had come in about ethical considerations um, as well. And I think, uh, Michael, you, you alluded to it as well, but the question is around ethical ethical considerations that need to be prioritized. So you're balancing the need to maintain uh, privacy consent from uh, children and youth, but 
but also needing to inform service and, and improve outcomes at that, that larger level. So any anything to share around that uh, from any of anybody? But maybe we'll flip it to you, Michael, because you were kind of alluding to already to ethics. Muted, yeah. Thank you. Uh, two things, two major things govern um, what, uh, how we share uh, data and information. One is in British Columbia, we have Aboriginal advisory councils. Every school district must have one. Um, and so the data that we have on Indigenous students in our district is owned by our Aboriginal Education Council. Uh, so they determine what can be shared. Uh, and who it can be shared with. So our uh, human early learning partnership data that we get from the University of British Columbia, it has disaggregated uh, Indigenous data. Um, that table decides um, where we, uh, I'm heading to an AI conference tomorrow because as we start to run into predictive data, there are all sorts of concerns about privacy um, and so that those are questions that we have been asking students about as we begin to collect data. There is a huge concern uh, among our teachers about collecting the data. Um, and so it's a, you know, one area we've got it pretty set and dry. This is how we do it. And another, it's a brave new world that we want to be really cautious in. Any other takers on that one? I can cover that a bit. Um... Within our own advocacy center and centers across Canada, there's definitely um, those regulations that we need to follow and also govern and govern all the types of information that you uh, release. And so we've been following that very carefully. And to be honest, Alina has been extremely helpful in helping us guide, guide us through that work and making sure it's anonymatized. And um, the other piece would be we hired an RDP. Uh, director of research and he started a week ago and we sat down and talked for three hours yesterday about the research that he's going to be doing on the data and the first thing that we're dealing with is the ethical approach to use of data and there's a, a huge governance piece around polytechnics and colleges and universities which we'll be following over to you mariana uh, yeah, so ethical use of data and AI, since we're on the, you know, massive data and, and language models uh, is critical for us and hence uh, why the partnership with the Vector Institute is being critical. They're global leaders in issuing guidelines around ethical AI and much of the work they've done has been adopted uh, globally. Uh, for us, though, all of our conversations are um, uh, anonymous. And we are we have used uh, you know leading edge tools like private AI to de-identify our data. So all the data that we use uh, we is is completely de-identified and, and used uh, for the purposes of either informing future programs, services, or providing insights uh, that are helpful to to change the e-health mental um, health. Awesome. That's awesome. Um, so maybe this will be the last one to take. And uh, I'm going to go to Rob first on it because you, again, you alluded to this concept of a data hub and all of these system partners living together in the same building, servicing common use, which is everybody's dream. Uh, but from a data perspective, sharing data about um, kids that have experienced child sexual abuse um, between our CMP the schools, the researchers, the health system, even though you're in the same building, I'm sure it's not, it's not an easy conversation. So any insights about integrating data across sectors for common purpose? Yeah, it's something that I'm extremely excited about and, and probably would have, you know, you know, talked more about it's, I think what we have is a, a unique situation where we have extremely good relationships with our school divisions and our RCMP children's services, Alberta Health Services. And there is an appetite to all share for the benefit of children. Everyone has this significant concern about doing it the right way and access and who has access and what you're allowing to be, you know, sourced through that hub. But I do know that there's about two or three places in Canada that are doing it and doing it really well. And our goal is to go research those pieces so that we can have a portal and share information amongst all those entities for the benefit of children. Because 
there's, I think the goal is so big and so good that we just need to work our way through that, but do it in a way that's very slow and make sure that we cover all of our bases. Any other takers? Yeah, I think it really speaks to uh, the challenge that that we face, uh, even in our smallest towns. Uh, my home community have less than, you know, less than fifteen hundred people live in it, and I live in Langley. And I don't know how many people, but there's lots here. Um, it speaks to that challenge of traditionally we would have all known this information in small groups, and we would have been able to really look after our children, and now this challenge presents to us is um, we live in large communities we are disconnected um, and i think it's really that tension that we're facing of how do we care for one another inside of the cities that we live in and we don't quite have the answers for that yet information sharing is going to be really important and of course that tension of privacy so uh, i think it's an area of growth uh, for pretty much everywhere in the country um, Jay from the Child um, Advocacy, uh, Youth Child and Advocacy Advocate uh, of Alberta. Sorry if I messed that title up. But Jay, I don't know if you're if you're still here and have a have a live question. I'm I can uh, unmute you. Yeah, I see you had your hand up. And we'll give you three, two, one. Okay, we'll uh, we'll jump off. We we usually don't kind of. Uh, do the the thing, but it's this platform seems to be allowing me to do that. But um, so no takers, I think we'll uh, we'll then kind of start wrapping up and uh, and uh, any last takeaways from the speakers, and maybe we'll do like a quick kind of two three word <laughs> sentence and and see uh, what your parting words are for participants, and then we'll we'll throw up the the next webinar on on screen to invite folks to. Um, I'll go to, from uh, uh, from the beginning to to the end. So we'll go Rob, Mariana, and Michael, and uh, over to you, Rob. Uh, just thank you very much for this, and it was uh, it's nice to hear other people that are doing the same work actually, and and very encouraging. And and Help Seekers has uh, honestly just been transformational again in our work, and we're looking forward to partnering with them for the next many years. Thanks, Rob. Mariana. Similar uh, feeling, Rob, and. As the world of data and use of AI to better understand it all, I hope we will be collaborating across the country because uh, only when we combine data sets, uh, the real power is harnessed. So it's a, it's a call to action for all of us to, to collaborate. Thanks, Mariana. And Michael. Uh, unmuted. Uh, yeah, I'd be super interested in what everybody uh, else is doing who is uh, who is on the webinar. I'm sure there's amazing things happening everywhere. And this idea of how do we raise healthy kids and how do we help us to be healthy adults? So thank you very much for having me. Excellent. It looks like everybody agrees um, with your messages that this was useful and uh, and worthwhile their time. So that's amazing. Thank you guys so much for for being here. Uh, the speakers, we can obviously do this without you. This is all your guys' work. Um, plug for the next webinar as well. This is digging deeper around analytics and, and actually getting your hands in some of our AI tools to see how the magic happens. Uh, our job is to make this stuff as painless as possible, where you're literally throwing the data in and you get the nice reports out. That's that's our goal. Um, so we'll we'll show you guys some of the tools that we have available for you. Uh, to uh, to actually do your own uh, work without without getting overwhelmed as well. So hopefully uh, you can join us for that March 21, um, 11 a.m. MST. I'm again I'm in Calgary. Have the bias, but that's 9 a.m. Eastern time. Um, so yeah, if you guys are looking at leveraging data in your work, um, anything from homelessness, safety, mental health, addictions, and you're looking for how you might use data to target interventions, target public policy change. Uh, come to this one and we'll we'll dig into that further. Thank you so much again, and we will see you at the next one. Bye, y'all. Thank you. Bye.